everybody hear me? Okay, uh, I'm going to call the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission of January 20th, 2022 to order. Could we have a roll call vote? Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Greenberg? Here. Maxwell? Here. Wilson? Here. Coleman? Here. Here. I want to apologize for our late start. If anybody's watching or listening, um, due to due to technical difficulties, which seem to have been solved. Uh, so I want to thank staff and TP TV for their work on this. Um, I I don't think there are any absences. Um, we will not, any statements of disqualification? We'll now move to oral communication. <clears throat> I'm sorry, oral communications. Is there anyone uh, who would like to uh, speak to the commission about an item that is not on the agenda, but is properly before us? I don't see anyone in the... Okay, thank you. I wanted to um, make a very brief oral communication. Um, looking at the city council's agenda um, for next, at their next meeting, which is next Tuesday, they are going to be appointing two members to the planning commission. And as I understand it, uh, Commissioner Smelt, Spellman and Commissioner Nielsen uh, were essentially termed out and this may well be their last meeting uh, of, at the Planning Commission um, if the council does appoint two more people and they would then take over at the next meeting. So I just wanted to thank uh, both, both of you for all your work. Your, from my perspective, your architectural knowledge will really be missed. Uh, and I do hope the council appoints on. I know Commissioner Maxwell has somewhat of a, a, a design background, but I think it would really be valuable to have uh, that kind of architectural perspective in terms of the extent that the commission is going to have any input on a uh, development project is probably going to be around the, the notion of uh, the architect, the design. So I did want to thank you both for, for the service and, and the time that you or on the commission or all the work that you did. Commissioner Conway. I just want to echo that. It has been a great pleasure and I've learned so much from both of you and you will indeed be missed. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes of December 16th. Um, are there any Questions or concerns about the minutes? Uh, there doesn't seem to be anybody in the uh, audience. So I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes from December 16th. I'll move to approve the minutes for December 16th, 2021. Is there second. a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? So let's have a roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Uh, Greenberg? Aye. 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 Thank you unanimously. I uh, will now move on to general business. Um, this is for the nomination and election of the chairperson and vice chairperson. Uh, does staff want to say anything about this before we get into it? Uh, they've actually, uh, this is the first. They've actually asked to uh, just present if, if you need, there's any um, refreshing of your recollection, but uh, we've gone through this a couple times before. Uh, we spoke for nominations. Uh, the commissioner being nominated, accepting the nomination, and then a vote for positions to do it either individually or 
together depending upon your preference. Okay, um, we'll move to the election of the chairperson first. And uh, let me just say under the bylaws, I don't know if you'd all be rushing to try to reappoint me as chairperson, but I cannot be chairperson because I, this is my second year and the bylaws limit the chair to a, to, to a two year term. Um, so are there, I, the way I'm used to doing it is we open it up for nominations. We see who gets nominated, when, whether they'll accept the nomination. Um, I would move that, uh, I would ask for motion to close nominations when there are no further ones. If there's only one person who's been nominated, uh, just ask that that person be appointed by consensus. Otherwise we do a vote on um, what, who the different commissioners would like to appoint. So um, I'll open the floor for nominations for chairperson. Yes, Julie. I nominate Commissioner Greenberg. Commissioner Greenberg, are you willing to accept that nomination? I am really honored, uh, Commissioner Conway, but I, I do not accept the nomination, I'm afraid. I don't feel like I would be the best person for that position at this moment. Uh, is there another nomination? Commissioner uh, uh, Spellman. Yes, I would like to nominate Julie Conway for chairperson. Commissioner Conway, do you, would you accept the nomination or? Yes, I would accept the nomination. Are there any other nominations? Commissioner Maxwell. Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner Dawson. Commissioner Dawson, will you accept the nomination? Yes, I will accept the nomination. Okay, uh, are there any other nominations? Is there a motion that we close the nomination? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to close the nomination. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Um, could you clarify what we're voting on? Or, oh, for now, I'll close Just to close the nomination. Hi. 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 This would go much faster if we were in person and we didn't have to have a roll call, <laughs> but since we do. Okay, so what what I'm gonna do is just sort of go around and ask each Commissioner, who they would vote for, I think is that that seems like the best way to do it. We've got two nominees. Um, so I guess um, yes, Commissioner Dawson. So I, I assume that Mr. Conway and I just don't vote, and then no, everybody gets vote. to vote. You can vote for okay. yourself, or you can vote okay. for somebody else. So, um, the clerk, why don't you just sort of read it off and uh, read off the commissioner's names and when your name is called, uh, say who you're going to vote for. Commissioner Conway. Conway. Dawson. Dawson. Commissioner Conway. Conway. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Greenberg. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, Con um, excuse me. Uh, Dawson. Different. That was Commissioner Dawson. So it's uh, Commissioner Dawson. You are the new chairperson. Um, does she take? Um, over the chair at this meeting or the next meeting? I believe it's it's the it's the next meeting according to the bylaws. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Um, so now we'll move to vice chairperson, and uh, I'm going to open the nominations for vice chairperson. Is there uh, um, anybody want to make a nomination for a vice chairperson? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Commissioner Greenberg. <laughs> Commissioner Greenberg, will you accept the vice chairperson role nomination? Um, could, could, could there be any clarification on what is involved in being a vice chair, actually? If the chair doesn't show up or if the chair has a conflict, then the vice chair would, would move into that role. Otherwise, you just have the benefit of being able to say you're the vice chairperson <laughs> Tennessee City Planning Commission for whatever good that might do you. Right. Okay. Um, I'll accept that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Are there any other uh, nominations for vice chairperson? Seeing none, could I have a, a motion that nominations be closed? So moved. The second. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Could we have a roll call, please? Conway? Aye. Lawson? Aye. 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 Passes and um, since there's only one nominee, I would suggest that um, Commissioner Greenberg be appointed uh, vice chairperson by acclamation. Um, if there's no objection, we won't need to take a vote for that. Okay, so congratulations to our new chair, chairperson and vice chairperson, and um, good luck for the future. I've appreciated being the chair, but I am happy to pass on the gavel if there was a gavel. Okay, we'll now move to item number three, which is consideration of ordinance revision. Um, consideration of ordinance revision. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, consideration of ordinance revision increasing inclusionary requirements for density bonus development. Um, how this is brought before us uh, by uh, Commissioner Greenberg and myself. Um, I'm not sure what the appropriate approach is, whether uh, one of us should sort of introduce the item uh, or whether staff would like to uh, have that. Do that. So let me hear, hear from staff about how you may want to um, staff okay with uh, with us presenting it, or do you want to present it? I'm not sure. I, this is sort of a fairly unusual way of doing things, so I want to make sure that uh, I don't usurp the role of staff. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think since it's coming from the subcommittee, you can go ahead and make initial comments. Um, I, I know we may have some some comments as well as, as follow up, but uh, it's it's your item, so your floor. Okay, thank you. So um, I can give a little background, and maybe Commissioner Greenberg can expand on it. Uh, as you know, the the state density bonus law has uh, changed recently with, to make it almost impossible for uh, the city to deny a density bonus project or density bonuses. And in addition to that, from my perspective, the, the, the density bonus law has a negative impact on affordable housing uh, possibilities in those communities with inclusionary or, uh, ordinances. Because as you all know, the inclusionary um, requirements can only be applied to the base. So we may end up, we may have an inclusionary requirement of 50% or 20%, and as we've seen in some of the recent developments, uh, with the density bonuses, the inclusionary 
units are less than 15%, uh, going down as low as um, 13 and even 11%. And given the need for affordable units, this has been seen as, at least uh, from my perspective, this is seen as a very unfortunate outcome of a law that was passed in order to supposedly encourage affordable housing. So at the housing subcommittee meeting, the question was asked whether it would be possible to, um, for the city to adopt a separate inclusionary requirement for density bonus projects. Um, the density bonus, the inclusionary requirement would still just be applied to the base, but it would be um, only applied to density bonus projects and not for non-density bonus projects. And what that seems to do, what that would do is to give uh, the city the opportunity to end up with a net inclusionary unit, either at what was traditionally the 15%, or as was discussed in the subcommittee, what our, what our current requirement is at 20%. So um, the question was asked to the city attorney and staff, and at the next meeting, the answer was, well, yes, it could be. Um, it's not prevented by law. However, it needs to be reasonable. And it can't make the, um, the project infeasible, financially infeasible by adding that requirement. So those are the kind of limits on it. And staff suggested that if the, uh, if the, com if the commission wanted to pursue it, you know, maybe we should do a study. Uh, they would probably recommend that we do a study, but um, that would be up to, you know, the, up to the ultimately the council if the commission was willing to go forward. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Greenberg and I got together and we put together this letter um, that sort of goes through this background analysis and then recommends <laughs> that the commission consider amending the inclusionary ordinance to increase the affordable requirement for density bonus projects, and two, to request staff to prepare appropriate ordinance language consistent with increasing the inclusionary requirement for density bonus developments and return to the commission within one month for its consideration. So one question that's before the commission tonight is, is it, is the majority willing to support these recommendations? The other question is, well, if there is a willingness to support the recommendation, what should be the, um, the inclusionary requirement for density bonus question uh, project? So there, I would say there are two relatively um, just, you know, a straightforward answers to that second question. One is that the inclusionary requirement for density bonus should require that 15% uh, of the overall project be, um, be affordable, uh, should, be, uh, should be affordable units. That would be consistent with what Measure U requires. That would be uh, consistent with um, actually the current ordinance where uh, for 35% projects with a, the density, with the inclusionary requirement at 20%, which is the current requirement, the overall um, inclusionary requirement would be 15%, about 15%. The inclusionary requirement for 50% density bonus projects would then need to go up to 25% in order to end up with a 15% density bonus. The alternative approach is based on the notion that our current inclusionary requirement is 20%, and therefore the total project uh, requirement uh, should be to get to 20%. And that would require, as I remember, and it was uh, the attached spreadsheet, I think, shows this, it would require about 25% inclusionary requirement for 35% density bonus projects and a 30% inclusionary requirement for um, a 50% uh, inclusionary uh, uh, density bonus project. So that's how I would summarize the choices. 
Commissioner Greenberg, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Or correct that if I got it wrong? So that was a great summation. And so, yeah, I think we're open to discussion of both the overall initiative to do this revision, as well as the discussion of the different models, the different scenarios that we might adopt. And, you know, this is also in with some understanding that a lot of the, and this is something also to ask of staff, a lot of the projects that are going to be coming before us are going to be these density bonus projects, many of which will be at the 50% level. And so just to kind of come out ahead of that and be aware that that's what a lot of the development may be before us as well. And so this could be a significant moment to do this. So before asking for staff response, I want to ask Commissioner Dawson, since she was on, she's also on the housing subcommittee and has no views on this. So I wanted to ask you, Commissioner Dawson, if there's anything you would like to add. Thank you, Chair Schifrin. I just really would quickly add that the current housing inclusionary ordinance, as was pointed out, is 20%. So that was the intent of the city council. And I think we should really, in making sure that we functionally get 20%, you know, we can look at the scenarios in which we need to do that. But given our direction from the council and our role to ensure that these types of directives are implemented, I think it's, I'm really looking forward to the conversation of, and pushing for us to get functionally 20%. And likely what Commissioner Greenberg brings up is going to be a lot of the developments coming before us are likely going to be taking advantage of this density bonus. And we really need the affordable housing. So 20% functionally seems like a reasonable approach. Okay, thank you. Is there staff, does staff want to respond to the proposal? Hi, Chair. Good evening. Yeah, I'd be happy to briefly speak to this item. I just wanted to say again that staff is okay with, you know, considering these types of policies. And it's certainly worth forwarding on to city council if the planning commission so chooses. We do just want to reiterate that, you know, analysis for these types of changes is very complex. The market has changed since we've done this analysis previously. And this type of analysis to make sure that we're not cooling housing production to an extent that is infeasible is just an important consideration for the commission to consider. Our analyses throughout the objective standards process have shown that the margins for development are very thin as it is given the current market. And it's likely that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many density bonus projects as it is. It's because projects really, projects that conform to current standards really can't pencil out at this time. So it just points again to the need to study this carefully. And in the past, that process has taken considerable time and was led by our economic development division. Do you have anything else to add, Eric? A couple other points I'd like to make. And the chair sort of alluded to this in his opening comments. If this recommendation does pass amongst the majority of the commissioners, we'll bring this forward to council. And then it's going to be up to them as to how, you know, if they want to pursue this, how they want to prioritize it. Our advanced planning staff has a lot going on right now. We've got the downtown plan expansion. We've got 
objective development standards, the Climate Action Plan, local coastal plan. We're implementing state law such as SB 9. So um, something is going to have to give if they, you know, want to make this a priority. Um, on the part of the recommendation that speaks to uh, returning to the commission in a month, um, that could be difficult uh, for a couple reasons. One, as Matt alluded to, we would be recommending a robust analysis. Um, the other is outreach, and, and that's consistent with city council policy. We want to make sure we go out to the community to get um, their thoughts on that before, um, uh, you know, coming to a conclusion on a, on a proposed amendment. Um, and then, you know, one other thing just to, to, to sort of consider, we've got a housing element that we're going to be embarking on here in the very near future, and that's going to, um, among other things, set policy for um, how we meet our arena numbers. And there's going to be a host of solutions that we're going to be looking at. This, this could very well be one of them. So that might be, the, you know, the most efficient time um, as well as the, the, the more sensible time to, to consider it in the context of other solutions. So that, that's the only other comments I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I see a comment from other commissioners. I, uh, is there anybody in the audience that might want to talk to this, uh, Tess, or can we just sort of have a discussion, questions and discussion from commissioners and combine all of the discussion at one time? I don't see any members of the public. Okay, so why don't we uh, just turn it over to commission discussion. Um, did I see your hand, Commissioner Spellman? Yes. I wanted to clarify one thing with staff. There's been some um, discussion around pending uh, density bonus projects. Do we, are we aware of in the queue that there are, there are several projects pushing for, let's call it higher density bonus uh, allocation? You're muted, Eric. Um, the ones we have, I know we have a, uh, a project on, um, well, other than the appeal that we have before council, um, that's already in the queue, so it wouldn't be subject to any changes. Um, we have some uh, uh, affordable housing projects that are making use of a different uh, density bonus um, that this really wouldn't apply to because they're, you know they're already well above um, what you're striving to attain here. I can't think of any off the top of my head that are in the queue. That's not to say that there wouldn't be any you know coming forward. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Um, I think there was a project on Ocean Street that was making its way through the process. Is that not is that project that, not happening? That's a that's an SOU project, um, and I don't believe it includes any um, density bonus um, in terms of number of units because there is no density assigned, um, and I don't believe they're asking for any concessions or waivers on that. I, I can I can check that real quick, but I, I don't believe that's a density bonus project. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. So, what I will say is. You know, this is a very complex issue. Um, it holds density bonus um, commingling with inclusionary ordinances is, is a tricky one. It's not one that I uh, pretend to be an expert in by any means. I think in the big picture of providing truly affordable housing for our community, there's no question that we need to find ways to make that happen. Uh, I do think this specific issue has quite a bit more nuance to it that needs to be sort of understood and vetted. Um, I think from one perspective, we're kind of in this um, reactionary mode because of the new state density bonus law and the lack of objective standards that sort of protect, um, you know, some of these regulations um, from, you know, preventing things that are, um, let's call it gross exaggerations of, of current zoning and, and something that's allowed under the new laws. So we're, 
we are working towards shoring that up uh, with the process to create our objective standards. Um, so there's this moment where we're, I think, not just us, it's, you know, most municipalities in, in the state sort of feel like we are exposed and, and don't have the tools to um, control some of this. Um, and, and there is this notion too that, you know, the density bonus is an incentive, right? There's been decades where density bonus rules haven't been applied uh, to projects. It's really just been, you know, very recent that um, developers have taken advantage of this. And I don't know the nuances of why that is. Is it, is it just because of the new rules? Are there new financing mechanisms? I, I don't understand that completely. I do know that we're in a very uh, unusual time for cost of construction um, in an exponential, you know, uptick in, in costs for doing projects. So I would want to be extremely sensitive to essentially eliminating future development uh, and future potential units that we would be getting into our community if we um, come down too heavy handed on this. So I would certainly, I mean, I support the notion of um, trying to find the balance between what is correct uh, and what projects can afford. And I'm, I'm not sure how that analysis gets done, but I know that that piece needs to be a very critical uh, piece of the argument. I mean, what we do know is if we put laws in place that aren't feasible, they, they don't get used and it, it is a real, you know, stifling mechanism to, um, you know, potential projects coming to the city. Other commissioners? Well, let me, uh, uh, Commissioner Conway, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your work on this. I agree that this is a potentially um, interesting um, tool. Um, and I particularly like the idea of um, uh, aiming to have this uh, fit in with the upcoming housing element as a tool that could help us meet our RENA numbers. Um, I guess that I think that um, I do have some concerns about it, of course, um, especially, you know, that we, we can do this. First of all, I'm fascinated that um, this is a potential tool, but again, it's as long as it doesn't make projects infe infeasible. Um, and which is, a, that's a huge but. And I would be concerned that the city very carefully does consider and document um, the ability to, so, th so that we can stand up um, with whatever we pass uh, and, uh, and whatever we end up supporting um, and knowing that it's gonna, it's gonna stand up to a challenge. Um, so I would say, um, I do support this potentially, but it really would be with that caveat that, that it needs to be thoroughly analyzed and we really need to understand what it is that, um, that we are getting. Uh, uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Uh, I just, I would like to um, just say that I, I, I completely agree with um, the things that have been said by both um, Commissioner Spellman and um, Commissioner Conway. Uh, the one thing that I would like to add is um, is this idea about incentives. Um, I mean, if if some and I and I do agree that that this needs to be analyzed um, by staff or by um, a third party or or something um, to to really get to the root of um, what's going to be a feasible you know feasible changes that that will not truly affect the ability to create housing. Um, but, um, you know, if, in, you know, from my perspective, um, Mr. Spellman brought it up already, uh, the cost of construction right now is, is at, you know, record highs, uh, in our area. And, uh, and just that alone is making 
um, construction of housing, you know, uh, it, it's going to make it difficult. Um, <clears throat> so by adding on, um, you know, further, I mean, I, I'll call it a restriction. I mean, adding on restrictions like that um, just makes it, to me, makes it more um, uh, difficult. And um, so if, if there's going to be additional um, guidelines or restrictions or, or whatever put on it, then, then what, what can be added to that as an incentive? And I think that's something that um, I, I think staff should look at in terms of what, what, what incentives could be added that, that may kind of net out the, the cost of that. Um, because we are talking about the, the, the cost associated with, with all of these decisions. Um, so, so what can be done to um, make it that to, so that that cost is you know negligible and, and get the housing that that we're talking about? Um, so I don't know exactly what those incentives would be. I mean, you know, maybe maybe something related to parking or you know so, you know I, I think that's something that they can look at and and um, and determine. But that's um, that's what I wanted to add. I, I think the, the idea of, of creating further incentives within, you know, within the density bonus program is, is a, a good way to look at it. Thank you. Commissioner Spellman. And then the other thing is, I think your article alluded a little bit to other municipalities that have entertained or even incorporated some of these into their ordinance, you know, increasing the numbers and uh, placing the inclusionary requirement on the additional density bonus unit. It was, wasn't clear if that was the case or are we aware of that? I think it would be good to have some examples of, of who's doing this and, and how that's working. Um, just to answer that, I'm not aware of any other community that's doing it at this time. That doesn't mean it can't or shouldn't be done. It just means that Sure. That nobody else has thought of it, or at least I'm not aware of it. I don't know if staff is aware of any other communities that might uh, have separate requirements for density bonus projects. Uh, let me just say, when the question was asked, I was probably as surprised as anyone when the city attorney came back and said that it could be done. Uh, I didn't expect that answer. Um, uh, let me respond to a couple of um, points that have been raised many of which I think are, are reasonable ones. Um, the question about why wasn't the density bonus law uh, used in the past, um, until recent years, and I'm sure Commissioner Conway can correct me if I, my memory is wrong since she worked in the housing area for so long. Um, there were, it was possible for local government to impose requirements on density bonus projects which many of them did, uh, including our local ones, to not let it work, to increase disincentive. And the reason was, from my perspective, is that what the density bonus does, the law does, is undermine the general plan. You go through a general plan process and you say that this is the density that you want in various parts of the community, and the density bonus law comes along and says, well, that's all very well and good, but all of that can go up by 35% or 50%, uh, or now in some cases, even 100%. So it's sort of, from my perspective, really is inconsistent with the general plan and with the whole community process that develops the general plan. You go to the community and say, this is what, what you're gonna be potentially seeing in your areas, and then it can increase on a project, by project basis significantly. So I think there was a lot of concern by a lot of communities about that um, role that density bonus has played. And um, it's just been in recent years when the state law changed to make it essentially impossible to turn down a density bonus project that developers have started to use it. Um, I think the concern, let me clarify a couple of things. There, there's, there seems to be uh, agreement that this would be a desirable thing to do if it made sense, if there was, if it was properly studied, if it was, um, you know, if it wasn't a disincentive uh, to development, maybe if there were other incentives. Um, a 
lot of what I'm hearing is similar to what uh, was presented at the time that the request to increase the inclusionary requirements from 20% was made. We should do a study, we need this, we need, to, you know, go out, we need outreach, we need all these things. On the other side of that equation is, we got a crisis, we need to do something about it to try to get more affordable units. And I think that's similar to what's going on here. The other thing I wanted to say is that, in fact, the, if the goal is to have an overall uh, inclusionary requirement of 15%, that already exists for 35% density voting projects because 20% on the base will lead to 15% on the um, total. And from my perspective, that's consistent with what's been going on um, since Metro O passed. It's longstanding um, city policy resulting from a vote of the people. And it's very, very reasonable. And it just seems to be workable. We've had at least one project that's come through with that density bonus 20%. And in fact, at the time, it wasn't really developers that opposed it. Um, and thus far, it hasn't been a problem. Then in terms of the 50% um, uh, density bonus, I thought it was very interesting um, that the first project that came to us with a 50% density bonus was the Center Street project. And the developer of that project um, uh, was willing to have the, uh, to add an additional four units to the, to the uh, four additional uh, affordable units to the project um, in order to get the support of the commission. That brought it, um, this overall requirement to 15%. And so from my perspective, there is evidence that the 15% as an overall uh, requirement is not unreasonable. It has shown itself to be feasible and we should, and, and it would, it's reasonable to support it. So while I would prefer if the world wasn't the way it is, that we could go for 20% overall, um, what I what I would recommend is that we go that we uh, recommend an ordinance with a 15% overall inclusionary requirement, um, which would only require a change for density bonus projects of 50% with which are getting a 50% uh, density bonus. So um, that. And then let me say, I appreciate the amount of work that staff is doing. I appreciate all the other projects they worked on. But coming back with, um, and, and they can certainly come back and recommend all sorts of other work, but coming back with an ordinance that simply uh, adds a line that density bonus project uh, of with a 50% 50, 50 density bonus would have a 25% uh, inclusionary requirement, I think is, is not a lot of work, could be done in a month. And then obviously it goes up to council if the council doesn't want to do it and uh, doesn't want to approve it without a study, they'll impose a study or if they just don't want to do it at all, they won't do it. Um, I think that from my perspective, um, the crisis in affordable housing and the need for affordable housing is just the primary concern that I have. So I would hope that uh, the commission would approve the recommendations with the uh, uh, understanding that the uh, ordinance language would provide for an overall 15% uh, inclusionary affordable requirement. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Uh, just regarding the, the Center Street project, uh, let's not forget that the, those additional four units, six um, affordable units um, that the developer was was um, willing to concede were was based on the fact that, that or based on the, the assumption that the project would not be appealed. So um, 
I think it comes down to like in, in that case, it comes down to a sense of certainty for the developer. So I think that's something to that needs to be understood that you know um, and it's and, and from what I'm from what I heard from um, from uh, Mr. Marlat is that uh, it seems like that project isn't going going in front of council just now um, or soon. So it, how, how many months ago did we hear that? Project and so you know we're we're talking about adding on multiple months to a project by going through an appeal. Um, so yeah, I mean I can understand why um, you know you know giving an additional you know some additional units would be beneficial. But it, it all comes down to certainty and um, because time is money, especially in in this you know, in, in this, you know, market. And so um, if there's a way to build in better certainty with, uh, with, with, you know, as an incentive in some way, then maybe that's another thing to look at. So, thank you. Well, the council will be considering it next Tuesday. Um, it may well be that the developer, I, I agree with you, I really tried hard to convince people not to appeal that project. I really think it was unfortunate that it was appealed. Uh, however, my understanding is that the developer might still be willing to uh, include the four additional affordable units. So while I agree in, in general that more certainty it would be desirable and time is money, the density bonus law gives a lot of certainty. This project can't be turned down. The, the city cannot reduce the density. Um, and, you know, under the Housing Accountability Act, it can't turn down the project. So, um, you know, the, the, the biggest uncertainty that the state has removed for developers is one, that they spend all this money getting their projects before the decision makers and get turned down. Or as we've seen with numerous projects, they come before the decision makers and they cut half the units on the project. Um, that kind of uncertainty and cost impact uh, is very a very uh, you know a, a major. So while I agree with you, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens at the council in terms of whether we lose those four units, which I think is is uh, is unfortunate. Um, in the grand scheme of things, that cost of the additional month and a half, um, I don't think is that great. Um, it makes that big of a difference. So um, we'll see at our, if this, if the commission approves this and this comes back, we'll see what the council does and what the developer does in terms of um, Center Street project. Commissioner Dawson, did you have your hand up? I saw another hand. Yeah, I was just uh, ready to make a motion, but I don't know if we're at that point yet. Are there any com other commission, Commissioner Greenberg, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, I would, uh, well, one, one thing is to keep in mind from my perspective that um, while I am very supportive of density and um, creating opportunities and even incentives for greater density, um, density without greater affordability can have complicated effects. So if you bring larger numbers and density of market rate housing uh, into an area that is adjoining, uh, in the case of let's say Ocean Street or um, the downtown plan, um, some of the last neighborhoods with some of the last remaining relatively affordable housing, the impact in terms of gentrification is greater. And so um, I think it behooves us to figure out ways to really not get to a situation with increasing levels of density and, le and lower levels of inclusionary, you know, overall in terms of 13 or 11 percent and so forth. And I know we've had debates here about the filtering concept and so forth, um, but I've, you know, over the years of my career and, and, and life in different cities seen great impacts in terms of gentrification and displacement. Um, when there's increasing rent gaps between um, high-end development. So I think um, that's motivating me here, this, this combined desire for greater density in, and infill development, downtown development, um, while being really careful. And in fact, 
in talking about the importance of doing studies, I would love to do a study, you know, on this kind of what are the potential impacts, not only environmental impacts, but social impacts of bringing, um, and, and there are cities that do this kind of work, Seattle does this kind of work, New York does this kind of work, looking at the impact of bringing dense high-end development into areas that are um, proximate to um, more affordable housing. And to what degree does that drive up rents in the areas around and so forth? Um, and I don't know if the city is interested in doing that kind of research, but, um, but certainly um, the idea that we'd be really careful um, in both welcoming and trying to ensure to the greatest degree possible that we at least stick with our current very modest and time-tested 15% um, inclusionary requirement seems to me um, perfectly reasonable. And I also would support if, you know, if there was, if there was broader support for it, you know, uh, trying to support the, the recent shift to the 20%. Um, I could go either way. Um, to the 15 percent, you know, in terms of these scenarios, based on what people think is 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 reasonable, but I don't know. I agree with Commissioner Schifrin, but I don't know that it really requires, certainly at the 15 percent level, extensive study um, to figure out that we want to maintain at the very least the 15 percent, given what we know can be, um, you know, really problematic impacts of bringing a lot of dense market rate development um, in concentrated in an area that adjoins areas of relatively affordable housing. All the commissioners, Commissioner Conway. Thank you for this discussion. Um, I think it's uh, really good to be talking about it. I, I would like to point out that one of the things is what our goals are. And our, our goal is to get housing built with the highest percentage of inclusionary units that are feasible that will get the housing built. And it's that that I really do think needs to be tested. Um, I thought it did before. I still think it needs to be tested. In particular, because while we do have a notion of the city attorney that this can be done, there are no other jurisdictions that have done it. And um, because of that, I think it is very important that the city be very sure that we're taking this on. And again, as I said, that it would stand up to any challenge. Um, and I wouldn't support um, proceeding with such an ordinance without a study. Um, and uh, although I'm, I'm very interested in both the idea of um, finding out what are the number of, of units that work and in which projects do they work. Um, because as many as we as as can be done and still get projects built um, is what we need to be going for. Other commissioners, Commissioner Dawson, were you wanting to make a motion? I was. Um, I would like to make a motion um, to request staff to the repair um, prepare the appropriate ordinance language um, consistent with increasing the inclusionary requirement. Um, for density bonus development and to return to the commission within one month for its consideration. And that includes both options. So prepare the ordinance language for 15% um, and prepare functionally 15% on the overall project and functionally 20% on the overall project. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, can we have discussion on the motion, Commissioner Conway? Would you accept a friendly amendment that would um, direct staff to bring it back after the, the financial feasibility of it has been studied? I would not accept that amendment. Other commissioners, um, comment on the motion on the floor. Chair, can I just clarify, is is that recommendation to come directly back, back to Planning Commission or to go before City Council for a recommendation to bring this back to Planning Commission within one month? No, uh, as I understand it, it is to, just to bring it back for consideration by the Planning Commission. 
And then if the planning commission, if the majority of the planning commission wants to recommend the one, either one of those two options to the city council, or both of them, they could do so. That is correct. Does that answer your question? Matt? Yes. Yeah, just to be clear that, you know, it's the council that directs and manages our department's workload. So before anything happens, assuming the commission is supportive of moving something forward tonight, the next step will be for us to bring that recommendation to them to see how they want to proceed, when they want to proceed, that type of thing. So that would be the next step. And then depending on, you know, their desire, you know, we'll act accordingly. We'll report back, certainly, after we brought it to them. But that's the next step. So do I need to modify? Yeah, I think it would be, it would be a direction to staff to, request the city council to Let me maybe give it a try here. So the motion would be to present this information to the city council and request their direction to, now I'm a little bit stuck, request their direction to prepare ordinance language for consideration and recommendation by the commission. Well, maybe it's, let's look at recommendation number one. Maybe it is to request the council to approve amending the inclusionary ordinance to increase the affordable housing requirement, the density bonus project to result in either a 15% overall requirement or a 20% overall requirement. So the motion would be to request the city council to amend the inclusionary ordinance to increase the affordable housing requirement for the density bonus development to either 15% or 20% overall. So is that how you want to reword your motion, Commissioner Billiton? Just for clarification, then that would just, that we would, we would not have an additional conversation with the commission then. It would just, it's basically going to them for their decision about whether they want to amend the ordinance. Right. And if they do, they send it back. And if they don't, they won't. If they approve it, wouldn't it just go directly for the staff and then they would do the. No, they'd approve the process. As I understand it, I'm sure I'll be corrected. If the council would approve moving forward with the ordinance, they would direct staff to prepare it and send it back to the commission for consideration. Is that, am I understanding you're shaking your head, Eric? Is that correct? That's correct. We prepare the language and then it needs to go to you first for a formal recommendation on the ordinance. So you're rewording your motion along that line. I don't know. Did you second it, Commissioner Greenberg, the original motion? I did. Will you continue to second this revision? I will. Is it clear to everyone what the motion is? It's to request the city council to amend the inclusionary ordinance to increase the affordable housing requirement for density bonus development to result in an overall inclusionary affordability requirement of either 15% or 20%. Is there further discussion on that motion? Yes, Commissioner Conway. 
Yeah, I just would, would like to be clear that I would absolutely support um, a, 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 a increasing the inclusionary requirements if it was based on a feasibility study. And I would, at the, at the highest level that um, can be demonstrated, that will ensure that projects still get built. I would support that most definitely. Um, and I would particularly support that work, which is a big undertaking, but having that work dovetail um, with the plans for um, achieving our arena numbers in the next round. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. I think that it is something that I think it's a very good question and I will not be supporting this motion as it stands now. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioner comments before we have a vote on the motion? Commissioner Dawson. You're muted, Commissioner Dawson. Apologies. I just want to reemphasize what's been said by other commissioners in that the city has had a 15% inclusionary rate for decades. So, and I know that conditions on the ground change. Um, but as pointed out, we are in a crisis and um, it's a classic government move to do study upon study um, before taking action. And I think we have a lot of data to support um, increasing the inclusionary. And so I, I hope um, commissioners will, will um, think about that as they move. And maybe just to piggy, uh, piggyback on that, um, I wonder if this, if there would be any difference of opinion on this if it involves sticking with the, um, the scenario that maintains the 15% that we've had since the 80s um, uh, versus the scenario that moves it to the more recent 20% um, as the functional net of affordable units um, overall, if, or if there's any difference there. Yeah. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I have trepidation too, supporting it as, as stated. I mean, there, we have a 20% inclusionary ordinance in play. Nobody's denying that. Um, we also happen to have a state density bonus law um, requirement in play. Um, the way this reads, and I think the way that the message is being, is being communicated is that, oh, we're not, we're not getting our 15 or, you know, I don't even know why we're saying 15 because 20% is our current ordinance. It's not 15%. And it's, in my opinion, um, not a defensible position and one that's actually quite confusing. Um, without having the study done to, you know, further validate this, I think it's just another measure to essentially put a halt to, to further projects coming in. And I think that's the wrong strategy. Um, yeah, I think the arena numbers are going to show that we need significantly more units on the ground and, and this is going in the wrong direction. I'm not saying that we, you know, can't and don't need to find ways to get more affordable, truly affordable units into our community. I just don't think that couching the argument this way and presenting it this way is, is helpful in this moment. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm hearing is the response to Commissioner Greenberg is it doesn't matter whether it's 15% or 20%. There's sort of a fundamental disagreement that if it would go forward, it should have a study um, and uh, maybe it shouldn't even go forward. So are there other, are there other comments from commissioners? So is it clear what the motion is? Um, Commissioner uh, Conway, did you want to add something? Um, you know, I, I just wanted to um, agree with something Commissioner Spellman said earlier um, and disagree with Commissioner Dawson. I don't think that we have um, good information on this. And this is an incredibly complex metric, um, as is, you know, financing any construction at this time. And I don't think we know what the impact would be. And I also don't think we know at all that this would stand up to challenge. And um, I'm concerned about that adding increasing costs and complexity, um, not just to projects, which is what you know we're talking about ostensibly, 
but also with our efforts with the city to come up with a realistic plan to get housing built. Thank you. And okay, thank you. Any other comments by commissioner? Um, I guess I would just say that um, I hear you and I think that, I mean, this is a discussion we had with the, um, with the inclusionary being raised to 20. And um, I should say, I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to do that, certainly with the 35% um, density bonus, which has netted us, again, 15% overall for these projects um, being affordable. Um, and that, um, you know, I guess sometimes it comes down to whether, uh, you know, we think that any housing, whether it's very high-end housing, is, is really what we need to have built more of in, in this town, um, or whether we think the crisis is such that we really need to, um, to advance, as we did in the 80s when we were one of the first cities to put an inclusionary ordinance on the books, um, that we really prioritize uh, projects that can, can balance the needs of affordability in the community. Um, particularly in the downtown and with the new um, planned developments around the, the stadium and so forth and along Ocean, um, and particularly given their location. So um, I think that um, I, I, a question I guess I would have also is that, um, so I think that we can frame it in a way that, that's pretty clear along those lines. We want to stick with as much as possible, given the state of a crisis in a city that is one of the worst in the world, uh, in the state of California, in the in the country, and indeed the world, we need to sometimes really be bold in saying that um, it's a you know it's a very it's complicated place to build. It's a, it can be very costly. Things are changing on the ground. It's also an incredibly lucrative place to build, um, and we need to hold our ground that we've had this 15% at least you know ordinance on the books for decades, and we need to hold on to that um, given the crisis that we're facing. Um, so that's one thing. But another is, would we, um, is it conceivable that we could have two motions, maybe, uh, this motion, uh, but also a motion that would involve one with a, with a study and that is couched in relation to the RENA um, housing element process? Is that something that? Well, anybody should make a motion to do whatever they would like to ask the commission to do. Um, the you know the housing element comes into effect in 2023. Mm -hmm. It's going to be filled with uh, other housing elements have been filled with um, uh, a great many programs that, that could potentially do a great many things and actually do nothing uh, unless there's follow up and one of the programs gets prioritized. And so from my perspective. Uh, what are the, the the request to sort of incorporate this in the housing element is a request to do nothing, uh, to maintain the status quo. And mm -hmm. I think that the status quo with the density bonus ordinance is a way of getting a lot of high density housing, for sure, uh, with the vast majority of it being uh, unaffordable to lower income people. And what we're doing here is trying to easily inch up, inch up the number of affordable it's units. If you look at the, uh, if you if you look at that spreadsheet um, and see the difference for the different size projects with the number of affordable units you get at either 15% overall or 20% overall, it's not that many compared to what you get now, but it helps. And I think that. Um, one of the reasons I support the 15% as opposed to the 20% overall, not only because we've had the history, but because uh, inclusionary requirements are a burden on the private market. It's a burden that they, uh, by and large, come to live with, and the, mar and the market sort of reflects that. And with this increased density, uh, allowing for you know many more units, I think that the market could absorb that. Now, would a study show one way or another? Well, I, I'm always, as you know, uh, somewhat suspicious of studies because you just change the variables, you change the assumptions, and it, you end up with a different outcome. And we live in a vol very volatile housing market. As people have talked about it here, um, the cost of construction has gotten out of sight. Well, the price of housing has gotten out of sight. The cost of housing has gotten out of sight. Does that mean that this can't be absorbed? Uh, my 
my sense is if the developers know what the rules are and the city sticks by those rules, they will figure out a way to do it in a market like this where there is um, the, you know, there is the ability to charge the kind of prices that can be charged on. That doesn't mean that developers, developments won't go bankrupt. I mean, that's the name, the real estate is risky and some developments will succeed because the market will be going up and other developments will fail because we get into a recession. Um, but in the long run, the price of housing in Santa Cruz has uh, appreciated greatly. The university continues to grow. Silicon Valley continues to grow. This is going to be a market that where housing prices are, being, are going to go up. We have limited land. Um, and uh, even with the rebuilding, there are limited sites. And where are all people with lower incomes going to live? It's great that the city is moving forward with the affordable projects that they're, that they're doing, but it's not going to solve the problem. And to the extent we can um, put some not unreasonable burdens on the private market to help meet the affordability requirement, I think is legitimate. And can yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Conway. You're yeah. muted. Um, thank you, Chair Schiffman. Um, the problem is that we don't know whether or not this is reasonable. Um, you know, you said that these are not unreasonable. We don't know that. I hope they're not. If they're not, I would be in support of going going towards a higher, um, going towards 20% if we had some certainty that that was going to be the case. Um, now, one of the things I could point out here is that Everyone here is an advocate for getting housing. Um, we all want that. We all think that the other strategy is an obstacle to getting that housing, um, which is just the reality of trying to figure out something that is um, doesn't have an answer. We don't know for sure. Um, you know, but moving forward, um, one of the things, first of all, we need to absolutely acknowledge what the reasonable process is. We don't, we do not direct staff. Um, the, the city council does, and they have their reasons for doing that. If we recommend, I, I feel like the most that is really almost our place to be recommending is that um, this is a potential area that could help, um, help us fill our housing gap. Um, you know, there's a, the, points in here that we need to be careful of is that it won't dampen construction. Um, and I agree with you 100% Chair Schifrin, we should not be bouncing around all over the place. Um, what we've learned over time with our inclusionary um, ordinances is that when they're stable, the market can take them into effect. But when they're bouncing around and unpredictable, they really, it, it, it can dampen um, the creation of more housing. Um, so I would, you know, just like to say that I'm, I'm really landing on that we need to know that what we're doing is actually going to move us forward. I can stop on that. I think I made my point. Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, just a couple more points to add. You know, um, we often. Um, at these meetings say things like feasible and pencil out. And we'll, the word that we leave out um, that is connected to that is profit. So developers aren't just covering their costs unless they're a nonprofit developer. And so you know, when we're talking about being um, really um, creative and thinking outside the box to cover the types of units that we really need. So you look at the arena numbers now and where are we under, underperforming? We're not underperforming in the moderate plus income bracket. We're underperforming in the lower income bracket. So just talking about housing production writ large without making that distinction, I think is a little bit of a disservice to the conversation because where we are underperforming is in these lower income levels and likely the arena numbers coming forward are going to be even higher in those levels. So thinking about how we move forward and and actually
actually address that, I think is really important and, and not forgiving that there potentially are nonprofit developers who can come in and take advantage, advantage of existing programs to make these things work. I would also like to say that the, all the developers, including the for-profit developers, are living right now under 15% and 20%. And it doesn't seem like we have a paucity of building happening in the city right now. It seems to be, if anything, ramping up. And so um, saying that we don't have data that supports a 15, somewhere between 15 or 20, um, I, I think isn't really reflected. And the last thing I will say is, we can do studies for days, um, but it's a modeling exercise. Nobody has um, the, the answer of what exactly, what they're gonna do is they're gonna take a whole bunch of variables, they're gonna talk to a whole bunch of people, they're gonna try to get their error as small as possible, but it's a modeling exercise. So paying for a very expensive study is a, a best guess. And so I, I do think we have decades of data to support the 15%. I, of course, would like 20%, but um, I, I think the conditions on the ground really show us that it's, it's, we're not having people walk away from Santa Cruz at these levels because it is, of all the things that share Schifrin said, it is desirable, it will be desirable in the future. And I think if we as a community want economic diversity, which in the past has made this a vibrant, very desirable place to live, then we have to think outside the box and do something now, not a year from now, not six months from now. Yeah, and I would just echo that. I mean, what we also know is that with the pandemic, with the remote work possibility, the reason that our, uh, our housing prices have been escalating 15, 20, even beyond percent annually um, has to do with the current conditions. This is going to continue to be one of the most lucrative markets to build um, anywhere. And people are, when with the rezoning of the downtown um, and the capacity of these 50% density bonuses, there's going to be enormous incentive. Or, I mean, when we talk about incentive, an enormous incentive to build small units for people who are commuting, you know, and so forth, um, uh, or, you know, telecommuting. Um, and so, uh, and you know, dense development for people who want to live downtown. So, um, particularly with you know the stadium projects and so forth. So we we know um, that, and we've seen stadium projects and what they've done to downtowns all over this country. So, um, including San Francisco. So I think that um, you know we are um, able to kind of look beyond our own. We were able to look to the history of decades of 15%. And we're able to look at the impact of massive amounts of, of high-end development to know that it's not going to solve the, the problem of the of the crisis that we're facing. Um, and so, if we can just hold on to this this little bit that we currently have, and it, it's it's quite modest. And you know, I, I've long said, I mean, inclusionary is 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 low-hanging fruit in a sense. It's it's what we can do given the fact that there's been this you know um, abdication. Um, this retrenchment by the state and the federal government, and we need other kinds of investment in social housing. But in the meantime, in order to staunch the, the out migrant, you know, the flow of people being displaced from this town, it's a modest thing that we can do. Is my feeling, and I think it's I think we can take for granted that it would be uh, reasonable given the history that we've been holding onto this, for, and and also given the profitability of this market. Okay, uh, unless somebody feels the need, uh, irresistible need to say something more, uh, I'm going to uh, ask for a roll call vote um, on the motion that's on the floor. Is there, are there any questions about what the motion says? Yes. Commissioner Conway? Could you please, could we have the motion read, please? Can the clerk read the motion or should I do it? I think it'd be best if you did that. <laughs> I can, but it probably won't be nearly as eloquent. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, the motion would be that the Planning Commission recommends that uh, the, that the, recommends that the, that the City Council be requested to amend the inclusionary ordinance 
to increase the affordable housing requirement for density bonus development uh, to result in uh, net affordability requirement of either 15% or 20%. Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? I'm going to vote no with regret. I would support it if there was going to be some study to substantiate it. Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? No. Wilson? No. Palmer? Aye. Hi, uh, it passes on a five to two vote. Uh, thank you all very much. We will now move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is item number four, the smoke regulation uh, amendment ordinance. And um, I think Catherine Donovan is going to be the staff person and I have sent in uh, extensive comments on the uh, material. So, uh, Catherine, do you want to go over how that's going to be handled? Um, yes. Uh, Commissioner Schiffman sent the, his comments um, on Monday, Tuesday. I was able to get him a response mid-afternoon today. Um, and he made a response to my response. So there's a lot of material there. And um, we had we had discussed the potential of providing that material to you and taking a 15 to 20 minute break to give you an opportunity to review that. Um, I think you as a council, as a commission would need to Make a motion on that. Catherine? So the motion would be. Oh, with test, test something. This is the clerk. I apologize. Um, I have received that. Um, it's been posted to the record of the matter online. Mail the public, and I've emailed it to all the. So you all have it back, as well as the public has access as well. I don't know that. Make a motion for that, but you all have it. So Did they need to make? Go ahead, Catherine. What? Do Do you need to make a motion to have a break? Take a break. I don't know. Well, how that works. I don't think we need a motion to do it, but I do. I think. I mean, it would be a question for the commissioners. Do you want to take some time to read over the comments or do you want to just push on forward? Um, they're pretty extensive. Um, if you'd like to have a 15 minute break, um, that would be fine. If you don't want it, that would be fine as well. So uh, what's the pleasure of the members of the commission? Commissioner Nielsen? Are, are you going to um, be discussing these, what, what you emailed? I mean, are you going to be talking about it anyway? So, yeah. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe we just hear you talk about it. But okay, I'm, well, I, hear you. I would, I'm happy to do that. Um, for the staff suggestion that it might be helpful to you to read it before we got into the discussion, but it's up to you. Any other commissioners? Um, have uh, thoughts about whether you'd like to take a little break to read it over the material, the edited material, or whether you just want to uh, move forward. Christian Spellman. Yeah, I'm happy to move forward and, and listen to discussion. Okay. I see Commissioner Conway is shaking her head yes. So um, why don't we, uh, this is what we'll do. Uh, we'll get a staff report. Um, then there'll be questions from commissioners. Uh, there seem to be two attendees from the public. So I'll uh, ask anybody, members of the public, um, 
for their input and then we uh, bring it back to the commission and <clears throat> maybe I'll lead off going through my uh, comments and concerns. Is that acceptable to people? Okay, so can we have a staff report, please? Okay, let me bring up my presentation. Sorry, it's hiding. Good evening. I, this is not showing censored on my screen. Can you see it correctly? Um, yes. You can see a slide okay. that says slope regulation updates planning commission Thursday, January 20th, 2022. Perfect. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to provide you with some background. Um, as you know, the general plan is the guiding land use document and the zoning ordinance implements the general plan. The 2030 general plan updated the policies related to development on slope, but the zoning ordinance still reflects the 2005 general plan in that, in that section. And I'm sh here are the, um, slope policies from the 2005 general plan. I'm not expecting you to be able to read all that, but basically they reflect the requirements in our zoning ordinance related to um, slopes from 30 to 50% and no development on slopes 50% or greater. These are the revised general plan policies in the 2030 general plan. And um, these policies have been, uh, they, they've totally removed the requirement for the percent of slope and um, they want to ensure development is designed to be in harmony with natural topography and vegetation. They talk about dealing with UCSD. They ask that we update the zoning ordinance to address new construction techniques and best management practices related to construction on slope and review the slope development provisions of the zoning ordinance and update them as being necessary. So you can see we've moved away from a very prescriptive requirements in the 2005 general plan to a uh, much more um, uh, science related review in the 2030 general plan. So in going through these uh, regulations, our updates were to comply with the general plan. We also wanted to reduce and streamline the number of applications we get for minor projects um, and to allow development on slopes where it is feasible and to require site-specific geological reports with science-based engineering solutions when they're needed. The specific changes that we proposed um, would be that for development on or near slopes of 30% or greater, we would require a geological review of the site. And if that site specific review indicated that there were um, issues related to the slope instability or, or other issues, then if there were engineering solutions possible, those would be required. If they were not possible, then development will not occur on those sloped areas. We've also, there's a, a section of revision of exceptions, exemptions from the requirement to get a slope permit. And we've revised those exemptions 
um, so that rather than requiring allowing up to 100 cubic yards of grading, we're reducing that to 50 cubic yards. We've also added some specific examples of the types of projects that would be exempt, such as um, uh, stairways and walkways. And then we've added in a provision of similar types of minor projects as approved by the zoning administrator. We've also updated the findings that to address visual and environmental impacts. Um, and we've removed the slope regulations from the list of regulations that plan development can vary the standards of. We believe that for plan development being required to have a, a geological report done if there's a slope makes total sense and that there shouldn't be a variation from that. So we're also proposing to update the application process. Currently, there are two permits for slope development, either an exception from the slope regulations or a variance. And um, we are proposing to create instead just a simple slope development permit. Um, and we're changing the public hearing requirement. Currently, um, if the development would be with greater than 10 feet um, from a 30% slope, it goes before the zoning administrator. And if it's within 10 feet of a 30% slope, it goes before the planning commission. And what we're pr proposing is to remove the requirement of a public hearing if it's on or within 20 feet of a 30% slope, which is the standard for requiring a permit. Um, and having a public hearing before the zoning administrator if it's on or within 20 feet of a 50% slope. I'm sure you are aware that um, a lot of these minor slope development permits come to you as um, consent items. And so they're really not gaining anything by having a public hearing requirement. So we're trying to simplify and make it um, cheaper for applicants who have minor projects to not have to go through a public hearing process. We've reviewed the proposed changes and um, in terms of consistency with the local coastal plan and find that they are consistent with policies related to coastal access and view protection. Um, and they would prevent or mitigate development on unstable slopes by requiring the geotechnical review and then either engineering solutions or relocation. And they would, the uh, amendment would also retain and strengthen the existing findings for slope permits. One of the issues that came up is whether uh, the proposed amendments would increase the amount of development on yeah, sloped yeah. properties. The general plan requires that property be developed at at least the minimum density unless there are constraints associated with a natural environment that require a lower <laughs> density. The, the, having a specific percent of slope, either 30 or 50, alone is not a constraint. There are many areas with slopes that are developed. You need to have a re geological report to establish whether there's actually an underlying issue related to the slope, a slope instability issue. So in order to develop at less than the minimum density, the current ordinance does not allow that. And because the 30% or 50% is not a constraint. So you need to establish the constraint through that report. Um, we also reviewed the slope amendment 
with respect to SB9, because this is one of the issues that Commissioner Schiffer, Schifrin was particularly concerned about. Um, the state approved S S SB9 last year, and it went into effect on January 1st. Um, the basic premise is that it allows two units on any single family parcel. It allows single family parcels to be split into two lots and each of those lots can have two units. The important thing about SB9 and this amendment is that the amendment does not make any change to the number of units or the number of lot splits that would be allowed under SB9. It has no impact whatsoever on what SB9 would allow. Another issue that was of concern is wildfire danger. Um, we know that wildfires are becoming an increasing danger, and we also know that they are exacerbated in slope conditions. The state has mapped about the very high fire hazard severity zones, and that's an a environmental uh, term of art, and none are mapped in the city. Um, however, the city is concerns about the issue and um, we added a wildland urban interface ordinance in 2015 and what this ordinance does is it flags properties that are within that wildland inter urban interface and uh, allows the building division and the fire department to apply additional standards for fire protection for those properties. Um, and we just wanted to reiterate that the proposed amendment would not add density, would not add additional units in areas of, uh, that are in the wild, wild land urban interface. And I'm providing here, I'm sorry if it's difficult to see, this is a map of our general plan land use designations um, with the areas that have 50% slope. So you can see the, the sloped areas are the black areas. Um, the areas that are residential, are single family residential, are the yet butter yellow areas. Um, the orange areas are medium density and the brown areas are high density. You can see that the vast majority of the 50% slopes are actually in the green areas, which are parkland or natural areas. And um, the majority of the remaining 50% slopes are um, along in the, in the low density residential areas. And you can't quite see it, but there's there's a line along the coastline also. So for our sequel review, we retain DUDEC, an environmental and um, planning firm, to review compliance with the general plan EIR. And DUDEC prepared an addendum as they determined that there were no substantial changes to the general plan um, from the proposed amendment that would invalidate the analyses of the EIR. And this is an area where many of Commissioner Shiffrin's questions um, arose. And so we consulted with our city attorney um, related to SB9 and a proposed amendment. And we were told that um, based on cases after climate change analysis became uh, required under law, um, the, the case law determined that regulatory changes did not invalidate prior analyses. Um, and also that new laws that create a mandatory duty of compliance are not considered due impact and do not invalidate prior environmental documents. And finally, they told us that any increases in development due to SB9 
are speculative at this time and do not create a duty to revise our existing environmental documents. We also had questions about um, whether the amendment would increase development. And as I said before, the development densities are determined by the general plan um, and they need actual constraints rather than the constraint of a generic 30% slope in order to lower the density and that those actual constraints are provided through those geotechnical reports. So the proposed amendment would actually decrease rather than increase development capacity. There's also a question about whether um, it would change where development, development could be located. Um, and one of the problems that we are seeing these days is that there have been a series of state regulations that have re basically removed local control, including SB9 and the Housing Accountability Act. And those, re those state re regulations require um, specific development capacity that can supersede um, what we allow with our development standard. So if um, one of these state laws requires that we allow higher capacity than is allowed in either our general plan or our zoning ordinance, those, those higher capacities um, would require that, would nullify our um, locational uh, restrictions and allow that development in the 50% slope if we just left it as it, as it is. Another question, again, about the wildfire danger um, and just reiterating what I went over before, there's the very high fire hazard zones, very high fire hazard severity zones set by the state. There are no none within the city limits. We adopted the wild, I'm sorry, that should be wild land urban interface ordinance. Um, and that allows development plans to be reviewed and specific fire safety standards to be applied within that, those areas. Um, in order to uh, recommend the ordinance for approval, there are specific findings that need to be made and to conserve space, I have um, abbreviated these findings, but you'll find the full findings in your staff report. And the findings are that the amendment serves and furthers public necessity and general community welfare. That the proposed amendments serve and further good zoning practice. And that they, the proposed amendment, amendment is in general conformance with the principles, policies, and land use designations set forth in the general plan and local coastal plan. And that is my presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Are there questions from commissioners? Uh, yes, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just um, had a question for staff. Thank you so much for the um, thorough presentation. But I guess I'm having a little hard time wrapping my head around um, the contention that um, First of all, just let me make sure I understand correctly. We currently, our, our, our current slope regulations have a total prohibition on development of 50% or over currently. Is that correct? On, on slopes that are 50% or greater. On slopes that are 50% or greater right now, there is no way to develop those within our current code. That's code does not allow it. However, there state law supersedes our code in, in, in certain instances. So although our code does not allow it, does not mean that it can't happen. Okay. That's 
new information, so that's good to know. But I guess, I guess the part that I'm having a hard time understanding and hoping to get some clarification from staff is that, um, so I guess maybe it's not as much of an issue if the state law allows it anyway. It's just hard for me to think of this as not substantially increasing um, develop. I understand the zoning, the density is not going to change, but if I have a, a, a plot of land where 50% of it is 50% slope, and previously I couldn't build anything over there, and now maybe I can put an ADU there that I couldn't, it seems to me that functionally this is going to be increasing the density and the amount of development in these areas that um, are in the WUI, which there are challenges around that, and also as, as something that we haven't talked about at all. I'm also wondering if staff has done any analysis or has any, any information about the risk of extreme, particip extreme participation of precipitation events. So um, uh, debris flows and just, you know, the kind of monsoon-like rains we tend to get now is not something that we previously had to think about. So just climate impacts and then also the density part. Thank you. Follow up because I think you you raise. I, I want to question staff about this notion that state law requires development of 50% uh, slope. Um, you did say in certain instances, and I think that's critical. Uh, a critical caveat. The, the, as I understand state law, and you can criticize me, or you can correct me if I'm wrong. The state law. Uh, says you can't use um, the 50% to prevent additional development if additional development is allowed. However, depending on the parcels, you can direct where that development occurs so that it doesn't occur on the 50% slope. So using Commissioner Dawson's uh, example, you have a three-acre parcel, you half of it, I, I, you know, a four acre parcel, two acres are on 50% slope, two acres aren't. You want to divide that parcel into two parcels and put um, four units, three additional units on it. You can do that um, and not be in violation of state law, but the city could still require that you not do it on the 50% slope. Is that correct or is that wrong? That's correct to a point, Chair. Um, we do we do have those standards in place, and they can be used so long as they're not preventing the density allowed under the general plan. So certainly, if there is a scenario where housing units could be moved to a, a different location, uh, the city could require that. Uh, but but what we're saying is to to clarify: is there is a possibility where the city would have to require or have to allow, I should say, uh, development on a greater than 50% slope. Uh, but the, the allowed density under underlying on that parcel wouldn't, wouldn't be changing. Right, but it doesn't, depending on the parcel, it doesn't necessarily have to happen. And um, the, by the amendment would eliminate the ability to stop the development on the 50% slope. So what we're also saying, though, too, is that um, the slope itself isn't isn't a, a feasibility issue. If the way we're changing it now, if there's a study in place that can show that that development is feasible on a 50% slope, there's no longer that constraint that that's in place. So it would allow that development on a 50% right. slope without. Uh, without the city uh, trying to move it, et cetera. So that would be, that would be one change. Uh, I, I will say though that, you know, developing on a slope is significantly more expensive and it's highly likely that a property owner would avoid developing on a 50% slope as much as possible. And we have very few properties that have 50% slopes that are residential that can be developed with residential. Um, so we really don't see that uh, that impact in, in any in any uh, real way. 
Well, except that under SB9, every parcel that's a single family parcel is potentially developed. Right. Ahead, but Kathy, it could be I know you've been I'm sorry, we've been cutting you off. Go ahead. Yes. I, I actually wanted to respond to something that Commissioner Dawson said, which was about the ADU. Um, ADU under state law, we, the local jurisdictions are required to allow the development of up to 800 square foot ADU. Um, and if the standards if their zoning standards would get in the way of that, then the zoning standards would not be allowed to apply. So under those circumstances, it doesn't matter whether we change our ordinance or not, they they would still be able to build an ADU. And the same is true as, as Commissioner Schifrin was saying about um, the SB9 unit. We, we must allow a minimum of two units of at least 800 square feet um, on any single family zoned lot. But to Matt's, Matt's point, generally people are going to develop where it is um, easiest and most economical, which is not going to be on the most sloped portion of your property. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll further mention that SB9 applies to only single family zone properties, which the city of Santa Cruz is currently determining to be the RS and R1 zone district, um, with which, which again, have, have very few uh, high slope areas in the city. Well, not according to figure two in the addendum, there are a significant number of areas that have um, deeper slopes that are um, they're all single family areas. Anyway, are there other questions? We can get into this further. Uh, if the commissioners have questions, I want to give the members of the public a chance to testify uh, before we really get into it. Commissioner Greenberg, questions? Yeah, I was, oh, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for this great presentation. And I was just curious in, and I, in understanding what um, is motivating this might help the public as well why why this the felt need to make this change now what is and when you talk about the benefit to the public like what is the benefit that you hope to gain from this change there, there's two driving forces one is the direction in the general plan to reevaluate our um zoning ordinance with respect to slope property um and the second is that um we we get a number of inquiries and sometimes applications from people who are in a situation where they have a slope and they want to do some sort of minor thing. Deck expansion come up, come up a lot. People want to make their deck three feet wider. But to do that, they would have to put new footings in. And because the footings in are, are in a slope that is 30, greater than 30 percent, they have to go to a public hearing. And that is expensive and it's time consuming. You know, that kind of development can normally done, be done quite quickly, but it's a, you know, two to three month process to go to a public hearing. Um, and it, it, it uses up staff time that could be spent on projects of more import. It doesn't make sense for staff to be bringing things to the planning commission on the consent calendar, because that basically means they don't really need a public hearing. It, there's no need for it to be aired to the public because it's not a complicated issue. It's not an issue that has a lot of impact. Um, so that, that, that is in the advanced planning division, we get comments from the current planning division about the, what they want us to do. And this is one that has continually comes up. Yeah, we've, we've heard from both the community applicants and as well as developers that we've talked to that our current standards based on just percentages are, are arbitrary. And they're, they're, not, they're not tied to what can and can't be built uh, safely. 
And what we really want to move towards is this science-based approach where we're allowing engineers uh, to tell the city uh, what, what can be built rather than a, a number that we've created. Other question? That's very interesting. There are no more questions. I don't know. We have two, I see two attendees um, and one of them has their hand up. So uh, I'm gonna open the public hearing and uh, recognize John Hall. And um, you'll have three minutes to um, testify on this matter. So go forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, yeah, my name is John Hall. I'm a citizen of the city. Uh, I, I really appreciate the clarity of the staff report. I know that there are num a number of technical issues that are frankly beyond uh, anything I would comment on. Uh, I would reinforce the um, statement uh, made by staff that my understanding is that uh, architectural um, techniques have advanced significantly uh, since uh, this code was written and that there are ways of building on slope, say from 30 to 50% uh, that uh, are uh, not at all uh, problematic. And indeed, it may be the case that building on a slope will uh, decrease uh, the problems of debris flow, uh, precipitation and so forth because uh, the, the site will be engineered. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to put it into a sort of demonstration by engineers and by the applicant that uh, here's what we propose to do and here's how it will uh, mitigate or avoid any kinds of uh, problems. So um, without, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't want to take away from the technical details that you all are discussing, but I think that the idea of making it on a case-by-case -case basis according to engineering that takes into account modern construction techniques makes a great deal of sense. And I hope that you'll keep that, however you fine tune the details, I hope that you'll keep that in mind as an advance over uh, simply a raw number of 30% or 50%. And I hope you'll be able to make a recommendation uh, for a proposal to the city council. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Um, there's somebody on the phone, uh, 831-212-0193. Are you wanting to testify? I don't see your hand up. That's the clerk. If there's anybody else on the phone that may want to testify on this matter? I see no one else. Okay, I'm, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring this back to the uh, commission. And I, I want to take some time um, to go through my, maybe I'll go through parts of it. I have comments on the staff report and as well as the addendum. And my biggest problem, frankly, is with the addendum. And I think the the problem, I, you know, as you may know, I teach a class at UCSB on environmental assessment that's essentially a CEQA class. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about CEQA and what its requirements are, and I start, try to stay on top of the, uh, the legislation and case law. And, you know, an addendum is um, allowed in those situations, and the staff report um, goes through these, where there are minor changes and where there are change, minor changes in the project and the project is the, is the general plan and where there are minor changes in the circumstances. As um, you, you probably know, CEQA requires that the analysis of a project impact be based on the environmental setting. And the environmental setting is defined as the state of the environment 
at the, pretty much at the time of the beginning of the environmental review process. So those are two kind of fundamental um, requirements of CEQA. Well, what I tried to argue, and I'll go through them in more detail in my comments, is that one, the reality of SB9, while the amendments don't change the density, the environmental setting has changed in a potentially significant way by, allow, by allowing for uh, additional, um, old, uh, you know, of, of essentially quadrupling of the units on single family sites. Now, you know, um, I understand that the, the, you know, the city doesn't have the ability for SB9 projects to review under CEQA, but this is an amendment to the zoning ordinance, and as such, it needs to follow the CEQA requirements. And the, you know, my my fundamental problem tonight, anyway, is whether the addendum is an appropriate document for um, for reviewing the and analyzing the impacts of the of, of the. Uh, proposed amendment. My concern is that, in fact, it isn't because the circumstances have changed so that now um, the SB9 allows for um, the, the, you know, the splitting of all the single family uh, lot, uh, properties and then two units on each. And, you know, I would take issue with the city attorney to say that the impacts of that are speculative. I mean, it's pretty clear that the city has no choice if a property owner comes in and says he wants or she wants to split their property, be it one acre, two acres, anything down to, I think, 2,100 square feet, they can do that and put two units on each of the new, new lots. We don't know through the addendum how many lots there are. Um, staff says there aren't that many. Um, the, the map in, in the addendum of figure two in, indicates that, you know, it looks like there are a lot of areas in uh, Carbonera, Prospect Heights, uh, Lorenz Seco on the, on the west side, where there's buildings on, uh, on steeper slopes. Um, that needs to be analyzed as far as I'm concerned um, and to be uh, um, adequate under CEQA. Um, in addition, you know, I, the issue of wildfire impacts is, 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 is an area that's changing under the, uh, under the uh, case law, but it's, a, as we know, it's a very serious concern. Uh, the staff, as I understand it, seems to be arguing that since there aren't any uh, very high hazard fire uh, areas um, in uh, in the city. Then there isn't that this isn't there aren't potential uh, wildfire impacts. Um, I know from friends who live in the Prospect Heights area, uh, who live on steep slopes, who have um, the the you know uh, wooded areas around them that there are concerns about fire sweeping down. And one of the things that's become clear in the law, uh, at least with CEQA, is that that CEQA concern is whether new development increases fire danger and allowing additional units in the, um, on these sloped areas is, um, is, I think, needs to be looked at. It can't just be dismissed in, it as in, in an addendum. So, I mean, I'm just, uh, those are some of my concerns. I would also, I was also concerned that the, the staff report sort of makes it seem as if the 2030 general plan required the changes that staff is recommending. The general plan does take out the specifics. It might have taken out the specifics because they're already in the zoning ordinance. They don't need to be re repeated. I have a different interpretation. The general plan says you have to reevaluate the um, the slope regulations. Well, I don't disagree with that, um, and make changes deemed necessary. Well, I'm not sure. I don't 
necessarily agree that the changes that the staff is recommending uh, are necessary. I have a concern about um, allowing development simply based on um, an engineering ge geologic report. I look at Daly City, I look at San Francisco, and engineers can engineer development on flat slopes of 90%. You know, you just give them the task and they will do it. And I, I think there is an environmental concern about um, having houses popping up on 50% uh, slope. Um, and I, I think to the extent that that can be avoided, and if it can be avoided on um, 30 or 50% slope, those are good policies and they're longstanding policies. And in fact, one of the concerns that I have, given that the only standards we can use in evaluating development are objective standards, they're one of the few objective standards we have that provide any environmental protection at, at all. So I have a, you know, I have a problem with the proposal, but I also have a um, my problem tonight and why I really think that this uh, that the that the uh, item needs to be continued is because I think the addendum is inadequate um, and. Um, um, inaccurate in parts and inadequate on the sequel. For example, um, well, oh, let me do say that I do support the changes for minor projects. I think that those are justified. Um, and if it was some way to separate them out from the rest of it, I would support moving forward with those. I think those are, what my concern is the development of, you know, what are gonna end up being large single family houses on uh, steep slopes in wooded areas where there's increased fire danger and um, where there's, um, you know, where, where, as far as I'm concerned, those are not appropriate places for um, the development. Page six of the addendum says erroneously um, that the existing regulations prohibit structures on slopes greater than 50% unless an exception to the regulation is approved uh, and, and replaced by a new requirement for slope development. Oh, I, oh I'm sorry, I added too much. Prohibit stru structures on slopes greater than 50% unless an exception to the regulation is approved. That is not correct. As uh, has been mentioned by staff and others, that 50% uh, prohibition is absolute under the current ordinance. Uh, it will, it goes away under the proposed, uh, under the proposed amendment. And that's a, a, in my mind, a kind of fundamental problem with the addendum. Uh, it's just minimizing the uh, effect of the amendment on the environment by saying, well, you could do it now, so what's the big deal? Well, the fact of the matter is you can't do it now. Um, okay, the, uh, that misstatement is repeated a number of times. And then the, you know, the addendum states numerous times that the proposed changes would not alter density and indirectly the number of new units that could be constructed. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, it's just not the case. Under SB 9, um, the, the amendments might not increase the density, but density can be increased and development can occur on slopes where um, it now can't be, it can't be built. And what that, and maybe ultimately the council will decide that that's what they want. But the environmental documents should evaluate, well, how many parcels are we talking about? Um, what are, how many of them are on 30% slope? How many of them are on 50% slope? Uh, <clears throat> staff says that there are only, as I understand it, there are only 40 undeveloped parcels um, that are on slopes of over 50%. So the worst that could happen, they all got chopped into two parcels and uh, two units on each of but it doesn't talk about how many parcels there are that are already developed on 30% and 50% slopes 
that under SB9 could be uh, subdivided and have additional units put on there. That's what I think the uh, CEQA document needs to look at. Um, and it doesn't. It, it doesn't take that seriously. Um, my concern um, that I provided staff on you know, sort of the biological resources, uh, where it says the uh, CEQA, uh, the checklist says, ask this the proposed project conflicts with any local policies or ordinances protecting biological resources. I think that those, those regulations do protect biological resources and eliminating the uh, requirement to limit development on those slopes um, has the potential for increasing um, the impact on bio, biological resources. We saw that with that single family house, uh, the prop, project in Carbonera, where while the property wasn't in the mapped area of sensitive habitat, Lo and behold, when an environmental when a biotic study uh, was uh, conducted, there was sensitive species that that inhabited that parcel, and that led to the revision of the um, of the um, of the led to the revision of the um, project. Well, you know, this isn't possible. Uh, under state law to have environmental review of individual SB9 projects. This is the this is the opportunity to try to look at what that um, what that development uh, um, what kind of environmental impact the development of the uh, under SB9 is going to have. And those should be looked at as um, part of the change circumstances that potentially lead to significant uh, uh, significant impact. Um, I think I, you know, with the hazards, I, I have concerns about the whole while I've mentioned it. Um, I, I'm sort of not wanting to take too much time, much more time, but there are wildfire impacts that we don't know anything about because there's no data uh, in the uh, in the environmental documents. So the potential impacts are just dismissed because it's not a high as an area, and it's um, you know there are there are standards, but it isn't the question of whether there's standards. It's a question of are there potential impacts, and that's what Seek is all about: is to sort of look at what are the potential impacts of a proposed project, and the you know the um, the removal of the 50% uh, um, prohibition. To allow for development on 50% slopes, um, which the only requirement will be by uh, uh, geotechnical requirements. There won't be any. There won't be any CEQA review because uh, these projects won't be subject to CEQA. So you know, there. This is the opportunity, and I think this is the time when it's required to really look at: Are there wildfire dangers that um, but that new development on these secret slopes that would be allowed um, under SB9 will lead to? I don't know. Maybe there aren't, but I think under secret there needs to be that analysis. So uh, my recommendation is that we continue, the commission continue the item um, for uh, additional CEQA review that incorporates the potential impacts of development in areas with steep slopes from um, the implementation of SB9 that provides additional analysis of wild potential wildfire uh, impacts um, from new development and evaluates the elimination of the prohibition of development specifically on 50% slopes under the SB9 density. So those are my concerns. Um, with the addendum and the, the recommendations from the staff. I appreciate um, your patience for letting me go through my concerns. Uh, I guess first we'll hear from Catherine and then from Commissioner Stein. Okay. Uh, 
um, I'd like to respond to some of those concerns. Um, the first thing you said was that this ordinance would allow additional units that are not currently allowed. That is that is not correct. This ordinance does not change how many units can be built anywhere. It does not change the number of units. The same number of units that could be built prior can still be built. So that, Captain, that that's is not what I'm saying. I don't disagree with that. I'm saying that in terms of environmental review, the, the circumstances in the city have changed from when the EIR and the general plan was done, such that now SB9 allows for additional development in these areas. And that change of circumstance needs to be recognized in the environmental document. May, may I continue to respond to you? Sure, go ahead. So according to the city attorney, case law has shown that when there are regulatory changes, we do not invalidate a prior environmental analysis. And that new laws that create a mandatory duty of compliance, such as SB9, are not considered new impacts and do not invalidate the prior environmental document. So I understand and I sympathize with your desire to have SB9 projects have some environmental review, but that doesn't mean that you can require environmental review of SB9 on another project. This, is, this project is not SB9. And the impacts of this project are not the impacts from SB9. And so the SB9 project can be built whether or not this ordinance is approved. There are no changes to what SB9 does related to this ordinance. So there is absolutely no justification for doing the CEQA analysis of SB9 for this ordinance. There's just, there isn't any way that it can be legally required. Yeah, I just um, want to I add too that we, we uh, sorry to interrupt Catherine. I just wanted to add to your point too, that we, we started this work uh, a, a year and a half ago, uh, even back in 2020, we began this work and this work on the addendum uh, started in the summer of 2021 uh, before SB9 was even approved. Uh, so in addition to Catherine's point, that, that's just another point that uh, you know this work couldn't take that into consideration anyway, uh, given that timing. I would like to acknowledge that the addendum did misstate um, the development on the 50% slopes, the, the current ordinance does not allow development on 50% slopes and the, the new ordinance would. However, as I said before, the ordinance would not allow an increase in density. And so there would be no increase in the number of units that would be built. So you're not putting houses that could not be built otherwise they might be built in a slightly different place, but it's still the same number of houses. So it's still the same number of households that could be exposed to wildfire danger. Um, it's, it's still the same number of units that, are, that would be built without the ordinance. So the addendum is the appropriate environmental review because there are no new impacts related to an increase in the number of units that could be built. Um, and one thing you asked for was a review of how many SB9 units could be built. But since there's no impact on the number of SB9 units from this amendment, there is no need for an analysis of the number of SB9 units 
that can be built citywide. The amendment does not affect the number of SB9 rooms. Um, I think I covered, yes. So there are a couple of the, the misstatements about the 50% slope. We will be making that correction prior to bringing this forward to council. Um, but we can't review SB9 for this amendment because it's not part of the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Spellman, I think it's on that. Your chance One. for, for okay on that, and then Commissioner Spellman, and then. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I just wanted to add, add to Catherine's comments at the end there that said, um, you know, we, we, we brought on um, DUDEC Consulting as our vendor, who's a you know, statewide CEQA professional, and the addendum process was recommended to us um, early on, even out of, out of an abundance of caution. There's, there's some professionals that would say this, this work could even be an exemption potentially uh, under CEQA. So we, we feel that we feel that the addendum uh, document uh, more than adequately covers uh, this work before you. Thanks. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add potentially a, you know, another perspective here and, and where I thought um, the direction of this ordinance change was going, right? There, I think there's, um, significant um, knowledge in the community that minor uh, development, whether it's for, you know, an addition or a deck or maybe even an ADU or even potentially a home on a, on a site, um, there are certain restrictions in place that, I, that seem to be overreaching, right? And um, as an example, the you know, the, we know that the county has, has no slope ordinance currently, right? So there's no restriction based on a percentage of slope. Um, I, in fact, I called the county geologist just to get his take on, you know, was that a wrong decision? I mean, this is something that's been in play now for over 10 years uh, on their slope ordinance, right? And, you know, some of the comments were, you know, 30% slope is not very steep as far as a, a slope is concerned, right? The 50% and over 50%, yes, you start to get into conditions that need to be controlled severely for, you know, runoff, um, engineering, et cetera. Um, but I think there is a whole host of um, opportunity uh, to allow for, you know, simple development on parcels that might have minor impacts with slope. And I guess I don't know how we uh, arrive to that um, number, but maybe it's just um, allowing development on 30% slopes that meet the criteria of the proposals. Um, and, and, you know, maybe the 50% is too much. I'm, I'm not an expert in that area and I don't, I don't know uh, exactly where that should go. But the, the current process of requiring folks for minor variations to go through a public hearing, uh, to go through that expense and to pay for those uh, scenarios, and, and in most cases ending up not even being heard by the and, you know, body that could approve it, it seems a little bit silly. And I think there's, there's a lot of pent up energy around that in the community, right? Not just uh, developers, but, you know, single family homeowners and, and folks that, you know, happen to live in those areas. And I think by default, you know, what's even more dangerous is that given those restrictions, people resort to doing stuff on their own, right? Without permits and without review. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's not a situation we want to be in, right? That's where we get into uh, scenarios that aren't engineered appropriately and are even greater risk to the larger community. So I think we ought to be smart enough to figure out a way to separate out simple um, 
amendment to the slope ordinance to maybe eliminate it based on a certain threshold. Um, um, I think that would be a very constructive thing for us to do. I do think the, the SB9 thing, and I think Chair Schifrin, thank you for your uh, analysis and, and detailed, you know, breaking apart of this whole situation. I, I certainly didn't um, dig into it on that level uh, when I reviewed this. And get, forgive me if I'm wrong, we didn't even, the SB9 part wasn't even in until later in the presentation here. But I don't think, I, I think staff's answer just now on that issue is, is fairly appropriate. I don't think we need equal analysis on SB9, whether or not we need equal analysis on development over 50% slopes, you know, that's potentially a different issue uh, for me. Um, and I do know that, you know, the municipalities that have already addressed SB9, it's not allowing, um, granted CEQA can't be required on those parcels, but if they are in areas of map biotic sensitivity, well, th those are still in play, right? Those don't get eliminated. Uh, the same way if you're in a high fire zone, which apparently the whole of Santa Cruz County is not, um, that, that would be a criteria too for not allowing that development. Um, so th those don't go away either uh, with, with SB9. Um, and I think even um, our one commenter had a good point, right? And I think it, it speaks to the, what is the level of, of risk to the community that you know makes sense here. I think that most projects that are minor in nature are going to improve properties that are potentially a greater risk today without any development. And uh, um, I think you could enhance the protection from wildfire and potentially from landslides, et cetera, water events, earthquake events, uh, by allowing some development in areas that are less risky. So that's, that's my take, and, and I hope we can, I know this um, amendment, let's call it, to the slope ordinance has been something that's been anticipated in the community for a long time. Um, and it seems like we finally got to the finish line and now it's kind of blowing up. And I, I think it's important to try and get some salient points out of this that we could actually move forward with in a simple fashion. Let, let me respond, and then I'll call on Commissioner Dawson, because um, first let me say that I totally agree about the minor projects. And in fact, the proposed change um, to section 2414030G, which is um, minor projects not including building or grading over 50 cubic yards may encroach on slopes greater than 30%, minor developments and improvement, it lists a bunch of things. And it's essentially, um, you know, allows for, um, you know, those kind of minor projects. And if there was a way to simply approve that as you're kind of indicating and move that forward and get that uh, before the council and approve, I have no problem with that. Uh, my problem is with the 50% slope and, and let me, say a couple of things in terms of CEQA. Um, contrary to what was stated about the fact that the addendum was started before SB9 passed, that is not relevant under CEQA. Um, it is, um, SB9 is the law now, it has to be taken into consideration to the extent that's relevant. But I'm realizing in the way this conversation has gone, that maybe my mistake in my comments was constantly referring to SB9. It's really not the law itself. Um, there's now a law that there are a lot of laws that allow for additional development, but there are laws that um, th there's um, there's changes in the law that allows for um, single family lots and single family zone districts to be subdivided and then have two units on each um, each parcel. That's now the law. That law is gonna affect development throughout the city. 
It is also going to affect development influenced or affected by this amendment. All I'm saying is that now that the law allows for this uh, significant increase in the amount of development on single family parcels, that needs to be considered in the environmental review. Um, you know, I think what Steph is saying about we don't have the right to, you know, uh, do environmental review on SB9 or regulate, or, or as it's a law, not a regulation, but we don't have the ability to do that. We don't have the ability to do seek a review of um, at, uh, projects going forward under SB9. But the reality is, just like the density bonus law allows developers to um, increase the density, and any CEQA review will look at what the proposed density is um, in, under the, as we saw with the project down Bay and Westcliff, um, the CEQA review looks at not the base density, but the total density, because that's the, de that's the density that's going to have the effect on the environment. And that's what CEQA is looking at. What will the project do to the environment? And that's what's relevant here. And in, in this case, there is a, you know, the, uh, the development potential of single family lots has now quadrupled. And it is, I think, necessary and appropriate for secret documents to recognize that additional um, development potential. So, that's why, so from, that's why from my point of view, and I, 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 I'm realizing that I shouldn't have kept repeating SB9 because it, it really, it's not the law that I think the CEQA review needs to look at. It's the, you know, it's the change in the development potential of uh, single family lots throughout the city. And in this, and as far as this amendment is concerned for lots um, that are subject to the code regulations. So, Cindy, I, I know you wanted to say something, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, I think maybe just in my own head, it, it, it's helped me to really think about this in that in the environmental setting, it, it ha we can throw out the talk about SB9, the environmental setting and the potential for development has changed since the EIR in 2012, right? So significantly. And so by removing a current prohibition, so and I find it interesting that in the staff report and, and also in the BDEC, they, they really kind of go like ended around the fact that they were removing a prohibition. I mean, it may be a good idea, it may not be a good idea, but we are removing a current prohibition of, of building up to 50 percent. Um, and, and the other thing that's helped me in thinking about this, like there's the geotechnical side, there's the engineering side, right? Engineers are really brilliant. Um, construction uh, techniques have advanced. So that's one thing. Um, and But then there's the climate crisis part of all of this. And so, yes, the number of units could be arranged a certain way with the 50% prohibition, but if we remove that 50% prohibition, now we could be building into a defensible space or a buffer zone between the actual dwelling unit and um, you know an area that wasn't developed because this pro prohibition exists. Those are the kind of things I would want to understand better before deciding whether it was a good idea to remove this prohibition that is existing and has existed for a long time. I want to absolutely concur with the other who have spoken on the minor adjustments in the section that Andy brought forth. I, I would be happy to vote um, affirmative and move that on, on the minor adjustments. I think that makes absolute and total sense. But I don't see how we can make an informed decision about removing a prohibition in current state of the environment in a climate crisis where most of this occurs in the WUI. Um, we have the extreme precipitation events, we have increased fire danger, and without really understanding how 
development would arrange itself, um, removing the 50% prohibition and having a full CEQA analysis that, I just don't feel like I'm informed enough to say whether that's a good idea or not. Um, and so again, I, I would be happy to move forward on the minor variation, um, but I think we need to continue this for a full CEQA analysis on the removal of the 50% prohibition. I would just like to briefly say that, that that line of thinking would essentially invalidate every general plan EIR in California. We have, we've talked to our attorney and there's case law that shows that, you know, 10 years ago or so when climate change uh, was climate change uh, studies were being required in general plans, that that change in the state uh, did not affect current general plan EIRs. Those, those were still intact and uh, were uh, uh, valid. So there, 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 is, there is case law showing that changes at the state level uh, do not constitute an impact that would require additional study at the general plan EIR level currently. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can even remove the part about climate in that given the current environmental conditions, which CEQA is gonna look at, we know that there's gonna be building where there isn't building right now. And so I, I just feel like I wanna understand the environmental impact um, of of that before moving forward on on a, removing an existing prohibition. Other commissioners. Um, Commissioner Conway. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you for raising the issues. I know all of us probably. I certainly always do wonder about um, development in sensitive areas. Um, and I appreciate having a chance to talk about this thoroughly. I think it's important. We're talking about it at some depth, at least. Maybe we're not talking about it thoroughly. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I really do support the goals of this effort. Um, you know, uh, staff started out talking about the three important goals. It sounds like we are pretty much on the, the same page about them. Um, especially in terms of the stream, streamlining and um, allowing, we may, we may differ on, uh, on whether we, the goal of allowing housing to be built um, where it currently isn't, if and only if it is feasible. And I think safe is a big word because probably nothing feels very safe right now. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, while I certainly appreciate um, and share a desire to just contemplate what are we doing in, in not just our city, but overall with um, how and where we build. Um, I do think that um, I'm comfortable that this CEQA analysis follows the requirements. And I, I question whether it is a good idea to decide to stray from very well accepted um, and tested statewide process um, for you know what constitutes an adequate equal analysis of on an, uh, an existing general plan. Um, so I guess I just want to say that I am really glad of these questions. I don't know that. It is um, reasonable of us to continue the matter um, to study something that um, I, I, I am not convinced that we that we'll get there, and I actually support the staff recommendation. Let me clarify that I'm a little confused. I'm not sure whether the you know sort of a red herring has been raised. I mean. I'm certainly not saying that the city's general plan EIR is inadequate and needs to be thrown out. It's used 
regularly to justify projects. And um, what we get is an analysis of whether um, things have changed that, and that, you know, I'm just sort of remembering this from the Bay and Webster project. The whole secret analysis is based on that it's just using the uh, general plan EIR. And the justification is that there weren't any changes specific to the project that could potentially cause additional um, significant impact. And that was the argument that staff made and people certainly argued about it. And, um, and if, you know, if the project moved forward. Well, that's what's really going on here with this addendum. The addendum is saying that there are no, uh, there have been no changes either in the general plan, yeah, in, in the circumstances that were existent at the time of the general plan that um, justify additional environmental review. And that's where I have a problem. I think that the amount of additional development that is now allowed um, is a significant change in the circumstances that were looked at in the general plan. I remember with the analysis in the, of the general plan analysis that was done for the Bay and Webster project, it looked at, well, you know, this project is going to, uh, this project is going to allow for maybe some units. How many units does the general plan uh, allow for? Uh, how many units have been constructed? How many units are in the pipeline? Okay, there, this project can be go forward. It, it doesn't uh, expand what's in the general plan. Um, and so what the general plan analyzed is what this project would go, you know, what, the, what that project was, um, it covered the density of that project. Well, the general plan, the, the circumstances have changed. The state law now allows for additional units in single family development on slope that it didn't at the time the general plan was adopted in 2012, uh, that or when the EIO was adopted or when the addendum was first started. Um, and what a number of lead agencies have found to their uh, detriment that if they don't look at what the current law um, requires in their CEQA analysis, that's what they're, they're, they're gonna be held to be not following it because the law says, what are the impacts of the project on the current environment? And the current environment is not the environment on as far as slopes are concerned that it was when the general plan EIO was done. So my, my recommendation uh, is the following that the commission approve a motion to continue the slope regulation amendment for additional CEQA review to incorporate the potential impacts of development in areas with steep slope from, from the increased development potential of projects on parcels in single family districts that were not considered in the 2030 general plan EIR to provide additional analysis of potential wildfire impacts uh, to evaluate the elimination of the prohibition of development on 50% slopes with the increased development uh, potential from uh, in single family districts. And finally, uh, to request staff to return at the next meeting with an amendment of the slope regulations for minor projects as proposed um, in uh, 2014 OCO um, G of the staff report. So, yes, Cindy, you're muted, Cindy. Uh, did, did you make a motion or was I? I can't make a motion. That's what I was proposing. If somebody else is willing to make it as a motion. Um, I would, I would, as you just stated, I would propose that as a motion. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by uh, motion by Dawson, seconded by Maxwell. Um, so 
Commissioner Conway, then Commissioner Spellman. There's a motion on the floor, so I assume everybody will now speak to the motion. Go ahead. Yes, I would just like to say that it is not appropriate for us to direct staff to come back at a next meeting. You know, that language really needs to get changed. That was a request. I'm sorry. I did not say, if I said it, I read it wrong. But what I wrote was request staff to return to the next meeting with an amendment of the scope regulations for minor projects. That doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Chair. But I still think that that is not, it's not appropriate for us to say that we're to direct their workload and when it's going to be. So if this, if this motion does pass, I think that should be changed to at the soonest feasible time. I'm willing to make that. I'm happy to accept that as a friendly amendment. So that would say as soon as feasible. I'm just, I'm actually just, the language I suggested initially was responding to the desire to move forward with minor amendments as quickly as possible. I think pretty much, you know, I'm not sure what kind of change to the proposal in subsection 030G would require to be consistent. If there's some language here now that would make it impossible to approve it tonight and send it forward. If I thought we could, I support approving it and passing it on to the council, but I think it might need to be tweaked a little bit. This recommendation could result in an additional work for staff goal substantially. We would recommend instead of continuing the item that you set the motion, not accept the addendum and recommend that to council. If that's, if that's what you're choosing. But if you do have additional comments on, on that denial of the addendum, you could include that in the recommendation of that acceptance. Yeah, I think because there's this sort of fundamental disagreement between staff and some of the commissioners on the super approach and that, you know, includes the city attorney that, you know, perhaps the best way of going about this is just seeking concurrence on what you as a commission can support and, you know, maybe moving those amendments forward. And then maybe as a separate motion or action indicating that you don't believe that the addendum for, for reasons stated is appropriate for the entire amendment package. Well, I'm not sure you're with both of you are saying the same thing or you're saying something different. I don't, you know, from my perspective, the commission has the ability to continue an item. If the staff wants to disagree, they can appeal that to the council, but the, by continuing it, we, the motion makes very clear what the concerns with the addendum are. If the staff doesn't want to move forward, you know, to respond to those, the commission recommendation, I would, you know, if the staff would suggest some language for moving forward with the minor amendment and I certainly would be willing to support that and to, you know, to separate out that and make that as a separate motion. The only problem I see with 030G is that it refers to a scope development permit and maybe if it just took out without a scope development permit, we could approve the rest of that, that code section. Now that I read it over again, it really isn't necessary. 
They could have said we're not, it's going to be without the permit. Well, you don't have to say that. So the, so the, um, the, the, let me just read what it says, Mr. Dawson, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you. What it says, what would be the action would be to recommend to the council approval of um, section, the revision of section 2414030G, um, which would read minor development, not including buildings as defined in section 2422154 or grading over 50 cubic yards may encroach on slopes greater than 30%. Minor development can include things such as walkway fences, retaining walls less than three feet high, above existing grades, planter boxes, stairways, steps, extending not more than five feet into the slope, greater than 30%, and similar features or similar minor development as determined by the zoning administrator um, may encroach on slopes greater than 30%, period. So um, if it's okay with the maker of the motion, and, and you know, I don't think it means we could separate it out as a separate motion if you prefer, but um, it would be to uh, recommend approval to the city council uh, of the proposed um, amendment of the slope regulations for minor projects uh, as proposed in 2414030G with the elimination of the last seg section um, that refers to a slope development permit. Does yeah. Steph want to react, react to that? Is that a, is that something yeah, we can do tonight? If that's the, you know, the consensus of the commission, we can certainly move that particular, you know, amendment forward, um, you know, as, as your recommendation. We'll, we'll also be bringing our recommendation to the council as well. Well, I guess I would suggest that we uh, split the motion. Yeah. That yeah. we take out the part on the slope. And so if it's okay with the maker of the motion and the second, the motion would be to continue the slope regulation amendment for additional CEQA review uh, to incorporate potential impacts of development in areas with steep slopes from increased development potentials of projects on parcels in single family districts that were not considered in the 2030 general plan EIR to provide additional analysis of the potential wildfire impacts and to evaluate the elimination of the prohibition of development on 50% slopes with the increased development potential in single family districts. So if that's okay with the maker and the second, that would be the full motion. Is that okay with Commissioner Dawson? You're splitting the motions or keeping them together? No, that would be the motion. And if that, after the commission acts on this motion, uh, we could do another okay. motion that would yes. deal with the minor amendment. Yes. yes. Is it okay with the second? Yes. So that's the motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Not hearing any, um, I'm going to call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Conley? No. Lawson? Yes. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Wilson? No. Salmon? No. Griffin? Aye. Motion passes four to three. Um, Let's turn to the, uh, uh, see if the, if I can state the second part of the motion as it now is that the, the motion to recommend approval, uh, recommend to approval for the consideration by the city council of um, an amendment of the slope regulations for minor projects as proposed in section 2414030 with the elimination of the last uh, phrase having to do with a 
permit. So is that, is that your motion? Commissioner Dawson, are you willing to make that as a motion? Uh, it'd be good if somebody else would make a motion to make it. Um, anybody else interested? I guess I can make the motion for that one. And I should add that I feel like that is what, you know, when I asked that question about what is the kind of public benefit of this change? Um, and uh, when John Hall was speaking about um, from the public about the need for this, that seems to be like the urgent matter um, from my understanding in any case. So I could make a motion about these. Um, the only problem is that I haven't written it all down. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can state what I have and see if you like it. It's to recommend approval uh, to the city council of an amendment to the scope regulations for minor projects as proposed in section 2414030D mm -hmm. uh, without the last phrase relating to a permit. Yeah. Can I just say that that's what I would support? Yeah. That's what, what I'm. Uh, um, that, so that would be your motion. That's my motion. So, Somebody willing to second that? Need a second. Uh, Commissioner Stallman. Yeah, I'm gonna support this motion, but I would hope that, I, I think the anticipation is that there is something beyond, um, you know, just decks and walkways and encroachment into these areas, right? I think the the task before us is what's reasonable. And I don't know that we have it spelled out in front of us yet, but I think, um, I still think there is a very large perception that the slope regulation is overly prohibitive at the moment. And again, I don't know where that fine line is, but I hope that the air is not going to be let out of the balloon and then this is it. I mean, I think we need to be smart and approve these minor changes. But what I consider minor or somebody else considers minor, I think is vastly different than what the, this language is, is reading. So I would hope we could find a way to have fruitful discussion around what is appropriate. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, if I, uh, uh, I think that's a really important point. I would hope that there could be a conversation, not just in the city of Santa Cruz, but in the county, um, you know, in the aftermath of the CZU fire. I know there's been a lot of issues in the unincorporated areas around slope regulations being modified um, and the need for people to move back and so forth. Um, I think um, it is a concern of mine that uh, I, you know, I know everyone shares, but certainly the the research about the role of wooey development on not only being impacted by wildfire, but actually generating increased wildfire risk, even independent of climate change. Um, so um, we, I, it, I think it it would be great to have a broader countywide um, conversation on on this as well, personally. Um, uh, because it ends up affecting people, um, you know, the, the, the fires are not observing these lines, these boundaries. So, um, and nor are the, uh, you know, the major, um, the, um, the, the uh, inundations, um, I mean, the, um, the erosion of the, of the, uh, the slopes as well in the aftermath of the fires um, as a result of rain and everything. So I think that, um, that would be a good broader conversation to have. So I just want to agree with that. Any other commissioner comments on the motion on the floor, which is to uh, recommend approval of the change to the slope regulations for minor projects as defined by the forest regulations? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Friendly. Aye. Commissioner Dawson. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Uh, Aye. Wilson. Aye. Stallman. Aye. 
Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Uh, difficult and complex issue for sure. Um, we will now move to information items. Does the staff have any information to give us? Oh, let me, before we do that, let me just thank staff for all their work on this and for um, the work also responding to my comments. I wish we had been able to reach a meeting of the minds. Um, ICWA is a complex law and subject to lots of different interpretations, as the city knows through the lawsuits it has to survive. So um, I want to thank staff for all their work on this. So information items, what's, what's in our future? Uh, just a couple, couple items. Um, just wanted to note that the, the project you had, the appeal you had on your last uh, meeting in December on the, the improvements to the 109 Seabright uh, residence uh, was appealed directly to the Coastal Commission. So um, hasn't been scheduled yet, but um, just an FYI. Um, I talked about earlier about the 130 Center Street being on Tuesday's council meeting. Um, that agenda and uh, staff report will be posted on Friday in case you want to review that. Uh, upcoming schedule. It's already there. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. thanks. Put up late this afternoon. Great. Great. Um, in terms of items for your February agendas, um, for February 3rd, we have the uh, small unit ordinance returning. Uh, to the commission for consideration. And then on the uh, second meeting that in February on the 17th, we've got an appeal of the zoning administrator decision uh, to approve uh, applications authorizing development associated with the uh, oversized vehicle ordinance um, in the coastal zone. Um, and then there's also a use permit for a, a fitness studio on mission. So that's what we have. Uh, definitely on the schedule for February. Is it possible for me to ask that when the RV ordinance come that we get some report from the Coastal Commission staff? I mean, that's uh, my big concern. The city is going through this process and it would be, I don't know whether the Coastal Commission staff is waiting, but if there's any information from them, it would be very helpful to, for us to hear that. Yeah, I haven't um, been uh, close to this effort at all. I, I can say that there have been um, uh, discussions between the two staffs. Um, whether there's any written information, I, I can't say for sure, but to the extent there is, um, we can certainly um, you know include it or at least characterize the discussions in the staff report. That'd be very helpful. Now, is there a potential date for the LTP amendments or for the objective standards uh, to come back? Um, I don't have, Matt, do you have um, that off the top of your head? I can look at the draft schedule. Yeah, we uh, currently we anticipate uh, the objective standards uh, in April. I believe the April, the first April meeting on the seventh. That would be yes. And what about the LTP amendments? That is anticipated for uh, March third. That time. I know that the amendments are the proposed amendments are out of for in a public draft. They're pretty extensive, so. I would certainly recommend commissioners, you know, try to get an early start on that because there's a lot there. No, are there any more information items? No. Okay. Um, there are no, uh, the housing subcommittee hasn't met. Um, and uh, the February 3rd meeting will have the recommendations from the housing subcommittee. So the commission can deal with it then. Um, 
Anybody else have a committee kind of thing? And then items referred to future agendas. Does anybody have items referred to future agendas? Seeing none, um, we'll, we'll be adjourned. Thanks till our, what is it, February 3rd meeting. Um, thank you all and stay healthy. And thank, thank you, you to Selman and Nielsen too. Yes, thank you. 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 Thank